Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Arnaud Violan, je suis le fondateur de Safetyne. On va parler connectivité, mais on va parler surtout sécurité, Safetyne, d'où le nom. Euh, alors on a parlé beaucoup d'aviation commerciale. Nous, on se focalise sur l'aviation générale. Et quand on se pose la question de la sécurité dans l'aviation générale, on se pose la question des taux de mortalité. Il n'existe pas véritablement de statistiques comparables. Et donc, on a pris une approximation pour regarder... Ces, ces statistiques et on est arrivé à la conclusion qu'il y avait un facteur de 100. A savoir que l'aviation générale est 100 fois plus mortelle, peu ou prou, par rapport à l'aviation commerciale. Et nous posons le diagnostic que c'est ce, intenable euh, au regard de la densification du trafic en basse et moyenne altitude, euh, des trafics de drones, hein, les drones récréationnels, les drones de mission, on en parle de plus en plus, et au regard de l'émergence de cette... Euh, euh, mobilité interurbaine dont on parle beaucoup, les City Airbus, les Yang, qui vont arriver dans les 5 à 10 ans qui viennent en termes de déploiement. Donc au même titre qu'il y a eu dans l'automobile une prise de conscience dans les années 70 où il a fallu développer des, des solutions d'ABS, d'airbag, etc., euh, nous prenons le parti de complètement réfléchir et de reprendre d'une feuille blanche tout ce qui se passe autour du pilote d'aviation générale, à savoir l'avion léger, euh, l'ULM, l'hélicoptère, le planeur. Et, et nous en sommes arrivés, euh, après avoir rencontré beaucoup d'entre eux, un fameux voice of customer, beaucoup de, on a épluché les, les, les rapports du BEA évidemment, et on a écouté surtout les pilotes qui se, sont, qui se trouvent souvent seuls dans leur cockpit, ça c'est un problème, qui volent peu, 15 à 20 heures par an euh, en moyenne. Et on s'est dit qu'il était possible de... Euh, de mettre dans un boîtier qui est portatif, qui est ici, qui va être, euh, qui va être introduit, dévoilé lors du Salon du Bourget 2019 et qui va être commercialisé en Europe francophone fin d'année prochaine, euh, des fonctionnalités qui permettent d'éviter ces écueils. Une des fonctionnalités qu'on a développées lors du CVS de Las Vegas, c'est ce qu'on appelle les alertes non explicites. Nous sommes victimes de surdité inattentionnelle, nous avons des, des limites du facteur humain qui même si l'avion envoie une alerte, un bip, un 1200 Hz, comme c'est le cas sur une célèbre vidéo de YouTube, où vous voyez un, un avion piloté par trois pilotes chevronnés qui sont en phase finale d'atterrissage sur Megève, euh, eh bien, ils ne, ne l'entendent pas, hein, même si elle hurle dans cette vidéo. Et donc, le boîtier va venir introduire une gradation multisensorielle de façon à ce qu'on comprenne la criticité du moment de l'arrivée, 15 secondes avant l'atterrissage réel il va y avoir une sensibilisation du pilote. Ça, c'est une première fonctionnalité. D'autres fonctionnalités, par exemple, on a l'e-call dans, dans, dans l'automobile. Donc, on regarde tout ce qui se passe dans le sport, l'automobile, dans la façon dont on, dont on gère le facteur humain. Et on a l'emergency call, encore une fois, qui permet d'avoir une assistance aux pilotes lorsqu'ils ont une difficulté. Eh bien, nous réfléchissons avec les pilotes à nous dire dans quel cas de figure euh, pouvons-nous euh, mettre en œuvre un tel système de façon déclenchée par le pilote ou de façon automatique. Donc voilà, ça, ce sont les sujets sur lesquels travaille Safetyn. Nous sommes sur le facteur humain. Nous sommes sur ce facteur humain pour tous, donc pour le pilote privé du dimanche. Et également, on a vu ce matin le mot SPO qui a été mentionné, le Single Pilot Operation. Nous pensons que nous allons arriver dans une décennie ou dans les deux décennies où nous aurons du One Pilot Operation, que ce soit dans les hélicoptères, que ce soit dans les futurs aéronefs ou voire même dans la, la mobilité interurbaine avec des Safety Pilots. Il va falloir comprendre dans quelle mesure le pilote prend quelle action et donc pour cela, il y a besoin d'objectiver ce qui se passe dans un cockpit. Et d'une certaine façon, ce, ces safety in box, encore une fois, qui sera commercialisé en 2019, a vocation à jouer un premier rôle dans cette compréhension-là. Voilà. Donc nous sommes accélérés chez Airbus, nous sommes incubés au CERN, et nous accueillons tous les acteurs, start-up, centres de recherche, grands groupes, qui ont envie de, de, de craquer, comme on dit aux États-Unis, de « crack the case », d'accidents aujourd'hui qui sont inacceptables, et qui le seront de plus en plus dans les décennies à venir. Voilà. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Euh, hier, pour euh, les bacheliers de France, c'était l'épreuve de langue vivante. Donc euh, aujourd'hui, nous avons un de nos panélistes qui n'est pas francophone. Aussi, nous avons décidé de faire cette table ronde en anglais. Si vous ne vous sentez pas de suivre dans la langue de Shakespeare, il y a des casques à l'entrée pour avoir une traduction simultanée. Donc n'hésitez pas à aller en chercher. So uh, I switch to English. <laughs> so my name is Stefan Barbensky. I'm the uh, chief editor of the Aerospace magazine. If you don't know us, go fetch on the web. You won't regret it. Uh, and 
we are talking about connectivity in the air. Well, it's a really complex issue with uh, multi -layers of, multiple layers of, um, of users, players, final users, you, me, airlines, uh, avionics providers, system providers, service providers, satellite bandwidth providers, and even satellite manufacturers beyond them. And unlike what maybe the title of this round table would seem to, to mean, uh, this is not really already a mature market. It's still in the making. So before looking how to go further, we will have a look at how to go how to get there first. So to discuss uh, this topic with us today, we have uh, Henri Guy, who is uh, Executive Vice President of Air France in charge of um, customer relations. We have uh, Vincent, I still get, can't get your name. Miguides. Vincent Migaides from uh, Thales, who is uh, Executive Vice President in charge of uh, strategy for commercial avionics. That's it. Okay. And we, and we have Steve Collar, who is the uh, chairman and CEO of SES, the currently largest satellite operator in the world. So to try to remain logical, we will follow the, the, the flow of the demand. So you are the users, you will have your time to ask questions after that. But we will start with Henri Guy from Air France, who will tell us what is the demand of the market and what is their demand. And we'll see after that how the industry is responding to, to the demand. Thank you. Yes. Uh Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, connectivity is really a, a, a big project for Air France and a, a priority now. It has not always been the case because uh, the customers a few years ago were not so much demanding for connectivity, but now it's clear connectivity a is a real criteria for the choice of the customer. So we are entering this uh, big adventure. I say adventure because, like you say, it's not very mature. Uh, we have all our 787 fleet uh, connected with uh, Panasonic. We uh, will deploy this autumn uh, connectivity solution from GoGo, a 2KU uh, system for the, the one who, who know everything about connectivity uh, for the 777 and the 330. And we will also connect our medium haul fleet, Airbus fleet, um, with a partnership between uh, Orange and Global Ego Entertainment. So um, for us, uh, connectivity is a really a brand new experience on board. Uh, and bringing the internet on board, being able to surf, it's just the tip of the iceberg. So we see four other major benefits of the connectivity. The first one, and it's not obvious, it's entertainment. You know that on medium haul aircraft, Today, we don't have seatback screen on all aircraft. And our customer asks for uh, entertainment. And with connectivity, you have a, a connectivity server where you can store movies, TV shows, and customer can stream them on their personal devices, smartphones, laptop, tablets. So it's a huge benefit because they will have entertainment on all the flight and not only on long haul. Um, the second benefit is we, we, we will be able to uh, refresh, update this content very quickly and to add new type of content like live TV. I'm sure that there are football uh, players or amateurs. And uh, uh, of course, you need real time uh, TV shows uh, for sports or anything. So uh, this is the first benefit. Second one is that connectivity allows you to bring new services to your customer. Of course, with connectivity on the portal, they will be able to see the update information about their uh, journey, about their luggage, uh, about their connection. We have 50% of our customers that are connected in, in, in Charles de Gaulle. Connection, in, not in Charles de Gaulle, but everywhere, is a stressful experience. So they need reassurance and information. And we will provide a chatbot to give them this information to give them their boarding pass, the map, how to uh, find the new gate. And if there is a disruption delay, 
to send you to send them their rerouting and boarding pass. So wi without connectivity, of course, this kind of technology wouldn't be able to be there on board. And uh, um, in, in matter of services, there is also the fact that our customer will be able to plan their journey on board. If you didn't have any time to plan it, you will be able to see uh, personalized travel guides on your destination. Uh, you will be able to book for accommodation, to book for taxi, to book for activities like, I don't know, concerts or whale watching. So this is a second major benefit. The third one, the third big impact is duty free. You know how we make duty free on board with the classical trolley on board. Uh, we think that with connectivity, the digital retail will maybe not replace in the short term, but complete and in the long term, surely replace uh, the classical duty free. Um, it will allow us to, um, uh, to have new means of payments, and payment is key for the customer experience, new means of delivery, either at the gate or at home and a uh, new uh, range of products. Of course, because you don't have any physical constraints, you can offer much more variety of products, and for example, groceries. If you come home, you can order groceries. And the fourth uh, real benefit is that uh, connectivity will empower our crew members. Uh, in Air France, uh, all our cabin crew, uh, and I know there are some of them here, and uh, pilots are equipped with tablets, with iPads. But the problem is, uh, once the, the, the plane takes off, you are offline. You don't have any refresh data. So uh, with connectivity, our cabin crew will be able to assist the passengers with the latest information and personalized offers. Uh, we can, also, uh, uh, we can uh, um, forecast also that the cabin crew can warn the maintenance teams about, uh, I don't know, a broken arm leg or broken screen and during the flight, send all the information photos uh, to enable the maintenance teams to prepare themselves and react very quickly uh, to, uh, to, to maintain uh, the cabin. Uh, for the pilots, uh, I think there is a whole new range of, uh, of opportunities. We are preparing on the pilot iPads uh, a view of the weather forecast all along the journey so that they can adapt uh, their route you can think of fuel optimization, route optimization. Of course, it won't replace in the short term the secure data of the ACARS, but uh, it will allow a much a better view of what is happening. And you can also think of medical assistance. You know that it's very often that we have problems of uh, uh, um, people in pain, uh, illness, and we don't have systematically a doctor on board. So you, you can have video chat to assist your passenger on board. So you see, and I think it's just the beginning of what we can see of kind of usage. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll see all the things you want to do with, uh, with connectivity, how the industry can answer all these demands uh, with the uh, products adapted to, to the need. So, well, um, in, in Thales, the way we view it, and uh, thank you for the introduction, and because it, it, it brought a, a very wide, different usage type from, from the cabin to, to the cockpit. And I think uh, at the beginning, connectivity uh, must be considered regarding if it's either for passenger or for crew member uh, application. Uh, on the passenger side, okay, let's begin from, 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 uh, from uh, from a passenger experience. So the question about connectivity, and as Thales, we are a connectivity uh, solution provider, but we are also an in-flight entertainment uh, uh, provider. It's all about having a seamless experience and how we can bring this seamless experience for the benefits of the passenger that we are all. Also seamless experience for the airline because they want to have uh, an easy integration into their IT system. They want to have uh, ability to manage, to supervise the network, to inject their application, their different usage, uh, and as well also having a, a seamless experience because provider like us, we provide the layers of 
cyber security that makes uh, uh, the, the network uh, safe not in terms of aviation, in terms of cyber security because in that case on the cabin side for passenger, you gather personal data of the passenger, you, pay, you gather a credit card a numbers uh, for payments if you develop, uh, for example, e-shopping on board, etc. So there is all these layers of different applications where really the, the, the experience for the passenger and the airlines must, must be relatively uh, seamless. And the third point, of course, as a technological uh, provider, is to have the right product at the right time in terms of maturity, in terms of ability to, to capture the maximum bandwidth provided by, by the latest generation of satellites, uh, and also minimizing what we call the swap, the uh, size, weight, and power, to ease the integration, uh, because at the end, uh, uh, an aircraft on ground is an aircraft that is not generating uh, revenue. So, so this is for the for the for the cabin experience, and and for the uh, cockpit experience. Well, in the cockpit, in that case, we uh, you, you must consider that there is two cockpits. There is what we call the aircraft control domain, and really this is the core avionics, core cockpit domain. And today, there is no connectivity on board, and the only connectivity is the pilot receiving the ACAR's message and taking the right level of action regarding what he has received on, on the ACAR's. And there is all this domain that is in between, what we call the airline information service domain, that is really a, a reserve domain for crew members, for pilots, where they can receive information from the open world and use it for really operational efficiencies. And this is where we believe also connectivity will bring a lot in terms of operational efficiencies. Having the latest en route uh, weather update, having uh, information about the traffic at gate, having information about uh, what's going on about the next, uh, the next leg for some passenger if they are in late or not. So this is interesting information. And the question here is how we <coughs> progressively connect uh, this middle domain uh, with either the passenger domain because some information might interest the passengers to know what will be the house, which gate they will find their next leg and, and so on. And also how we connect with all, of course, the safety and the certification issue, uh, this middle connectivity domain with the really reserved aircraft control domain, which is really 100% <coughs> safe uh, and, and must remain safe for, for that point. Well, that brings us to the, uh, the provider of the connectivity by itself with the satellites. Uh, Steve, you have a fleet that provides capacities in KU, KA, geostationary, <coughs> MIO orbit. Uh, do you have the capability today to provide coverage for all these services or is it something that will come in the near future? And uh, what does it represent in your overall market? Thanks, Stefan. So first of all, uh, apologies. In case it wasn't obvious, I'm the reason that we're all speaking English. Um, and so I really apologize for that. Um, yeah, and, and to say a couple of things about SES. So SES is the largest satellite operator, as Stefan said. And in exactly the same way that when we deliver uh, direct-to-home TV experience for uh, here in France or in the UK or in Germany, in France we sit behind Canal Plus and we, they deliver service across our satellites. The same with Sky in Germany or Sky in the UK, they deliver across our, our satellites. And for aircraft connectivity, our customers and those that deliver service across our satellites are Talis um, and also GoGo, -Go, Global Eagle and Panasonic. So you have uh, a chain of delivery through satellites to satellite service providers to airlines um, that all have to uh, bring a model together that works ultimately for you and me when we all then go on planes and fly and, and, and use the experience. Um, we, deliver about, we deliver service to about 2,600 aircraft a day, so 2,600 aircraft of the approximately 5,000 uh, connected aircraft. And so half approximately are supplied in some way, shape or form by, by SES through our customers. And our customers deliver service to 35 airlines on a global basis. So when you think about it in those terms, it sounds fairly large and fairly impressive and fairly mature, but I think Anne's uh, experience at Air France and, and frankly a number of other airlines' experience is that it's a long way from being mature uh, and it's a long way from us being able to deliver 
the kinds of service that we collectively want to deliver. And I want to thank the organizers who, anyone who was sitting in the main room an hour or so ago trying to use the Wi-Fi, had very much uh, an airline experience of two years ago or three years ago where you were connected but couldn't get any data. And, and so our job as satellite operators is to produce satellites that are c capable of delivering more and more and more connectivity for a lower and lower cost per megabit. And that's really our job. The service provider's job is to integrate that with services and portals uh, and tools that fit with the strategy of the airlines. And I think the airline's job is to provide an exceptional customer experience. I think that's Anne's primary goal, is to make sure that when I then become a passenger of Air France KLM and I go on board, I feel that my information is available, that everything is personalized for me, and that it's like moving my my home on board the plane. And that's ultimately where that chain is all looking to get us to. We're not there, but we're much, much closer than we were two or three years ago. Two or three years ago, we were using satellites that were relatively generic. They weren't even specifically designed to deliver data. Now we're using satellites that really are designed very much to just deliver data and do it at a lower cost per megabit, which means that when you're on board a plane, you get access to much more of that data, much more of that throughput in order to support your email, in order to support you streaming movies, and in order to support that whole idea of you taking your life with you on board a plane. And that is only going to get better. So uh, we've launched six satellites in the last six months, which is, which is not typical. Um, and three of those satellites have been specifically what we call high throughput satellites. And all three of them have been very much tailored for uh, aeronautical services, services to aircraft. In North America, which is still by a distance the largest market for in-flight connectivity today. Uh, in the Americas in general, including transatlantic. And most recently in Asia, which is probably the largest growth market for in-flight connectivity, given that North America is now largely, most airlines have already made their decision. So, it is a market that's growing very, very fast. It's, a, um, it's an, an, an industry that hasn't got to where it needs to get to yet, at least from my perspective. Uh, but I think it's getting there and getting there quickly. Well, uh, so one of the uh, issues that uh, people like uh, Anna have to deal with is that uh, Actually, there are many, 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 many kind of solutions. You have many, both of you, you have many contenders on that, on that market. And, uh, well, we, we discussed uh, this afternoon that uh, it was just like a matrix of solutions, and you have to pick the right ones. Should I go KU, KA, L-band, S-band, uh, by satellite, ground to, ground to air, both, regional, global? So how do you deal with this? We don't deal. We try to do the best choice at the moment. And when we look at it, after we see, uh, was it the best? But uh, uh, it's true that we face, as an ally, and we are not experts, uh, many different technologies. And we know that technology is moving very fast. So you never know if the choice you make will be good in three years' time. Uh, but it costs much money. For example, for Air France, deploying connectivity, what we decided on all our fleet, it's 100 million euros. So it's difficult to be totally, uh, to make errors on those amounts. And each year you have to add the bandwidth cost that is uh, about small. very small, very small, <laughs> around 15 million euros per year. So if you can, yes, make promotion, it will be good. We're negotiating. Uh, <laughs> That's it. Uh, so what, it's true that it is a matrix, but the complexity comes from the, the fact that first, these are huge modification on your aircraft. You put antennas on your aircraft, you make holes in your, on your aircraft. It's not just adding, uh, I don't know. Uh, so um, uh, you have to have a solution that is compatible, appropriate for each, for your aircraft subtype. And not all are certified because we are still in the beginning in the, of the adventure. Uh, then, if you have a, a, an aircraft online fit, 
for example, our future uh, 350. Um, in fact, uh, when you choose your IFE supplier, your sit-back screen supplier, uh, you don't have many choice left for your connectivity supplier because there are authorized couples and forbidden couples. So, in the end, you remain, and of course, you have the economic choice because the bandwidth cost can be very different from an operator to another. So when you add all of these constraints, you end up with one or two solutions, that's all. And in the end, and there is also the fact that um, uh, some provider will be very efficient for medium haul network, for example, in Europe, and other will be more efficient for uh, long haul network. So most airlines have different solutions. And when you add the problems of line fit, uh, availability, certification, you end up with many suppliers. And we, what we lack in this industry is standards and norms so that uh, independent of the different suppliers, your customer experience and your portal can be a seamless experience. Uh, when, you, when you're trying to, so to find the solutions, who is your... Uh what are you talking to? Are you talking to the aircraft manufacturer, to a solution provider, to all the steps, all the different steps, and you make your whole your uh, market? You're compelled to do both. To the supplier, you launch an RFP. Mm -hmm. But if you, uh, if you have a line fit, you have to, for example, for Boeing 787, you talk to Boeing. And for Airbus 350, you talk to Airbus. And they tell you what choices you are allowed to do or not. And in these choices, you will ch choose with your RFP. That means that that could be an argument for future generation aircraft. Say, oh, I will better go with uh, that one because I can get that type of connection through that. No, not yet. I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm not sure. There is a big piano and a small chair. And okay. Uh, okay. So as a, well, Thales is more than just providing a Vionics. It's a, uh, you have you're offering more. How, how do you uh, deal with this as a facilitator for all these, uh, these um, uh, markets? Um, well, it's a, it's a very complex game. We must recognize it's a very complex game. Uh, first of all, because uh, we recognize that uh, the, the, mar the market is maturing. Uh, brand new technology, new capabilities are, are coming along uh, very quickly on, on the market, satellite market, and there is a lot of question mark, and I'm pretty sure we will have, I hope we have time to discuss about it, but what would bring the, the Leo or the Mio uh, in that market will be quite interesting to, to, to look at. Um, so really, uh, for us, is really to be, at the same time, at the cutting edge of technology, both on the cabin and on the cockpit and to offer the seamless experience by aggregating the technology and, and the service. Um, and, and this is important because we are dealing with multiple interface. We must please, of course, the airline, which, which is our customer on the, on the cabin side, but we must please also the OEM, which are our customer on the cockpit side and the integrator for the airline on the cabin. Uh, we must deal with partners, such as uh, SES, for example, uh, we must deal with different providers that will uh, put forward our application, our portals, etc. And we, we must provide a level of safety on one side for the cockpit and a level of availability, reliability, uh, customer experience on the, uh, on the cabin side, providing, of course, all the layers of, of cyber security. Because we, we do consider that uh, the securing the data and securing the transaction, uh, all the contain on the passenger side is as much as important as securing the safety critical data for, uh, for, for, for pilots. And there, of course, there is no the same, uh, same game. It can be life on one side, but it's economics and trust of your passenger on the other side, it's, it, it's very important. So really, the game is about aggregating everything into a seamless package. Uh, or at least the most comprehensive passage, and uh, I agree with, uh, with you, Anne, in the fact that, uh, and it's quite normal regarding the level of maturity of, uh, uh, of, of this market, of this segment, but we are, we are lacking norms, we are lacking standards, where all, uh, at some point, the industry can gather together, and it will be, uh, it will be easier for everyone to, to have such an such environment. So, well, 
you you're partnering with uh, with Thales on the uh, CS17 satellite uh, so you could be just providing bandwidth but you go deeper into the market does that mean that you will have you will have, you have the possibility to be competing with your own customers on other that's <coughs> Uh, no, so the answer what, what, that, why do, do you take the risk? So, so the answer that's no. Um, but I would say that, for, for, and so I completely agree, by the way, with both the need for and, frankly, the responsibility of the industry to drive, and I'm not sure if it's standardization, but to take the pain of delivering uh, in-flight connectivity away from the airlines and to make it an easier decision, to make it more straightforward, to step up and provide more of the services that airlines need in order to put connectivity on board planes and operate that connectivity and, en and enable airlines to do what they do well, which is deliver exceptional experience to get to, to passengers. That's what I think Anne wants to be able to do. And I think it's incumbent on us as an industry to do a better job of making those choices easier, but also lowering the, the um, the barrier to change because at the moment when Air France makes a decision to go with a particular operator or a particular technology they're having to invest a lot of capital and they're having to make a decision for a long period of time and to change that decision if the if the service provider is terrible is a really hard thing to do and I think the industry can't rely on that and in fact it's dangerous if it does what the industry needs to rely on what I need to rely on and what Talis needs to rely on is being an exceptional <coughs> service provider to the airline. And that is what <laughs> generates longevity of service and loyalty such that that service provider can then take Air France through a journey that says, OK, today the right answer might be this satellite, this service provider, this modem, this antenna, but tomorrow it might be something different. And we are going to help you through that evolution as we go from generation one to generation two to generation three, because it will happen. You're, there's no one in the audience here that's using an original iPhone, right? And there's a reason for that, because technology does evolve. And what Apple has done, and, and all technology providers have done, is found a way to allow customers to evolve through technology without it being painful. And because we're relatively early in this game, we haven't figured that out yet, uh, but we will. And that's exactly where our focus is. It's, it's how do we produce and offer a seamless network with standardized hardware that can be upgraded over time um, that provides a great glide path for all airlines into higher and higher bandwidths at lower and lower costs uh, without it being an incredibly painful decision. So, and, but in short answer to your question, no. The, the service providers to the aeronautical industry do something very, very different to what SES does. We're very, very happy to partner with them but it's incredibly important also to spend time directly with airlines so that we really understand what the need is. Because the worst thing that can happen is the satellite manufacturers and, and satellite operators are building a whole bunch of stuff. And when we talk about investment, so when we make an investment in a new satellite, it's anywhere from half a billion to a billion dollars. And when we invest in a new constellation like we did um, just less than a year ago, it's probably an investment of one and a half billion to two billion dollars or euros. And so these are huge, huge bets that we're making as organizations, huge, huge investment decisions, and not to be informed by the ultimate users, the ultimate source of that demand would be kind of crazy. So that's why you see uh, satellite operators inc increasingly want to get a better understanding of the real market and why great partnerships between operators and service providers is, is the future and offers airlines the best deal. If I understand well, uh, there's someone lacking in this, uh, in this panel, it's the aircraft manufacturers, because uh, apparently you want to choose uh, a system, you have to drill holes in, your, in, the, in the frame of your aircraft to put the antennas, and if you change, you have to remove it, uh, close the holes, Drill new ones for to install a new system, more or less, or more or less. Okay, <laughs> I am a candidate here. <laughs> yeah, there is a norm, a standard that is a uh, arank. Uh, I don't know how. So, so. Thank you. Uh, but uh, in the real world, what you're telling happens, yes. It's because, because well, if there is, if the planes were designed to be able to handle 
these systems before, even before you make the choice of the frequency of, or if you're looking up and down or both? Well, yeah, in the, if in the future generation of aircraft, uh, they could embed the, the possibility of having many generations of uh, technology, yes, it would be better. But at the time being, you have different types of antennas. So the aero aerodynamic drag is different uh, depending on the antenna. So it's still very moving uh, so that each certification on each aircraft subtype is different. And we are in aviation. Uh, it's always something difficult. We see on a yeah, mature yeah, technology... Pl planes like are supposed to fly for three decades. Yes, <laughs> but uh, when, we, when we buy a seat for a retrofit or line fit, when we buy a screen, when we buy anything on board, it has to be certified. Mm -hmm. So I imagine that uh, some years ago with the first IFA systems, it was also very difficult. And so it's just the fact that we are beginning to learn together uh, to build this technology and it will match us like the other ones. But I don't think it will be uh, like on the ground. It remains in an aircraft, so you need certification and the process will also will, will always be a bit complex. No, and, and I totally agree with that. I, but I think if you look at parallels in other industries, there's no question that um, as the industry matures, the process gets more simple, it becomes more standardized, and what ultimately prevails is the best service provider. So the, the aircraft manufacturers don't want to make life difficult for their customers, right? They want to give them choices, and they want them to give them the choices that they, uh, that, that they want. Um, and I think it's, again, as we develop better and better and more performance solutions, as they become more cost effective over time, I'm confident that the best systems and the best partnerships will ultimately be the ones that become in, that, that, that get installed and performance and cost effectiveness will become the things that really make those 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 decisions at the moment there's a lot of complexity i think that complexity will reduce over time i think the service providers will likely consolidate i i think that's what typically happens as industries mature i think solutions will become more similar I suspect, actually, that we will end up largely in one band, because for me, there's only one that makes ultimate sense long term. And all of these things will contribute to what you're saying, which is what Anne's saying, which is we need, it needs to be an easier, the, the decision as to what system to put on board needs to be easier, and the decision to be able to swap it out if it's not performing needs to be easier, uh, and, and that's our job. So you say one bound will, be, will prevail? I think so. Well, I have a slight different view on this one. <laughs> um, yes, we can imagine that one bound will, will prevail on, on, the, on the, the cabin side. There will be still some requirements about safety for, for the cockpit. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure yeah. you understand it's not your core business. But uh, the L bound uh, and the development of the L bound and, and the, the work we have done with our, uh, our flight link uh, uh, product shows that it's very interesting what's happening on the cockpit side. I know it's not it's not main main business uh, and uh, it doesn't concern us as passenger, but for pilots it will bring a lot of value. And it's also a way to generate not revenue for airlines, but to generate savings in, in, in order uh, by using this link, dedicated link, uh, to continue to improve safety first, uh, because this is a pillar of aviation. And secondly, also to deliver operational efficiency uh, in terms of fuel savings, having the right test uh, weather reports on board uh, and everything. So, so uh, I guess, and, and for some time, I don't know what will be the case, in, uh, of course, in, in, in 15 years, but for some times, we will have still a segregation between the, the cabin and the cockpit. And probably it will lead to have two different bounds because they have two different characteristics. On one hand, you are looking for high uh, high power, high bandwidth, lowest cost. On the other hand, you are looking for safety. You are not looking for bandwidth, but you are looking for safety and you are, you are looking for the four nines availability all around the globe. Yeah, no, and I think that's right. And I'm really, I'm really, so those systems kind of exist and I think they'll become in, enhanced over time, but they will never be able to provide anything like the kind of connectivity and the broadband nature of the connectivity that's demanded in all other ways. And I think what's gonna happen is once that broadband connection is available on every single plane, if once that becomes commonplace, which it will, I think we'll see more and more applications being developed, more and more value being passed on to customers, more and more creativity from airlines. And frankly, more of that information, more of the 
avionic information, more of the information about how the engines are performing, the maintenance requirements of the planes, what needs to happen to the planes when they land, the amount of data um, that is generated and, and is potentially and can be generated on board planes that isn't being provided in real time is enormous. And there's huge value in doing that. We're not yet at the stage where that data is being collected, sorted, connected, and provided back in, in a way to provide insights to whoever might be interested in that data. But we're not very far away. And so what needs to happen and can now, we can see the future at least, um, is that when planes are genuinely connected all the time to a broadband connection, um, there's a lot more value and a lot more things can be delivered uh, that don't currently fall under, let's say, passenger services and don't currently fall under the kind of the umbrella of safety and, and really narrow band connectivity. And that's really exciting. I think, um, I think it will change, uh, it'll change our ability to, um, it'll change the aeronautical industry, it'll change the airline industry. I, and, and, and there are going to be 8 billion travelers in 15, 20 years time rather than 4 billion today. So I mean, this industry is huge, is growing, and any optimization, any more intelligence that we can build into that industry uh, is going to be massive. And when you think that planes spend most of the time in the air, if they're not connected and they're not connected to a broadband connection, you're losing a ton of incredibly valuable information that can completely transform the way Air France, for example, operates. Uh, just to complete, if you may. Uh, I totally agree. I think we don't have yet the, the, the good uh, business model. Uh, the suppliers of connectivity are under economic pressure. We can see it because they have to invest massively. They have a big growth. Uh, so the negotiations are just a nightmare. Uh, for the airline, as I said, it's expensive. The customers, they don't want to pay for such a long time. But at the time, we are compelled to make them pay just because of quality, if you offer it to everyone, quality would be so bad. And the, the, um, and the, um, the costs are, are huge for the airlines. But I think that uh, we will make huge savings or huge revenues. But it's just that we don't have developed them yet. I was talking about retail on board. I'm sure there are studies that talk about $18 billion of revenue for the airlines. Um, I don't. I don't know if it's a, just a fancy figure of, or if it will happen in 10 years' time, but we see the digital retail on the ground. So uh, the maintenance could be much more efficient when we're talking about fuel optimization. There are huge figures uh, behind this. So maybe it is so difficult now because we don't have the right business model. And uh, we, we will find more and more usage and more and more value and I think we will build the right business model in some years. So we are talking about something like 20,000 planes to be equipped uh, for the next uh, eight or 10 years. Uh, so I understand that you see one band prevailing, I guess the one with the smaller antennas that gives less drag. Uh, and, and higher performance. And higher performance. Uh, you see the market consolidating as it is maturing. But technology evolves rapidly, and there are some people coming that could add some more disruption in, the, in this business. Well, I, I think about uh, the new constellations uh, that are proposed, like uh, OneWeb or Elon Musk Starlink. Yeah. Uh, do you think they could disrupt this? And regarding the band, uh, I've been discussing a lot with people in Boeing who are working on the Q and V band saying that, OK, there is attenuation with rain, but the planes are most of the time above the rain. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, and I don't think this is, a, uh, is the panel for Satellite 101, so I won't, but, but I think, so, I think all of the constellations that are, that, are, that are coming promise something. So we operate the only broadband constellation today, and we operate it in medium Earth orbit, and we operate it equatorially, which means it spend, we spend almost all of our time delivering um, services to customers. One of the challenges as you go closer to the Earth is your, your satellites see much, much less of the Earth, and that means you need hundreds of them. And, and I talked about the kind of investment that we need to make to launch geostationary satellites or medium Earth or orbit satellites 
Constellation operators will need to invest $5 billion, and in the case of SpaceX, $10 billion in order to put these constellations up, and they're very, very sort of technically and economically uncertain. So that said, I think it's awesome that these guys are looking at, at, at using satellite technology to develop these kinds of services. I'm a skeptic when it comes to LEO, and I've been one for years, but that doesn't mean that I don't hope, actually, that these things do develop, uh, And because I think disruption is good, and if we don't continue to, you know, we, 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 it's easy to be a little bit negative about the kind of services that we deliver, but bear in mind this industry is probably at best five years old, maybe three years old. It wasn't very long ago where the average connectivity to a plane was about 500 kilobits. It's now closer to six megabits. That's huge in terms of what, what it's taken. And if I look at a related industry, if you look at the cruise industry, if you went on a cruise ship even two years ago, you would have been sharing a two megabit connection with 6,000 other people. <laughs> I don't share a two megabit connection with my 12-year-old daughter. Um, <laughs> but now, if you go on a cruise ship, and most of the, cru the major cruise lines, you'll have a connectivity to that ship of half a, a gig. And that's, again, a giant, giant difference in terms of capability. And we're on that path in, in aeronautical. So I do, I think it's going to take a little while for this industry to mature. And the, disrupt, the continued disruption is actually what we need. We need to keep driving ultimately to a place where I do get and you all get to go on board a plane, to bring your own device, to stream whatever you want to stream, to you know, read your own emails in your own environment. And I don't think you know, we're not that far away from that. And all of the additional services that that enables for airlines um, you know, I do want to do shopping and pick, you know, the minute I walk off the plane, I, you know, I've forgotten to buy something for, the, for my wife and the minute I step off the plane, it's waiting for me. I can't do that today. You know, in the not too distant future, that service will exist, I'm sure. It would be saving couples. <laughs> yeah. Saving yes, marriages. That's, that's what we do <laughs> every day. <laughs> so, are there any questions in the audience? Thank you for the for the most interesting conference of the day, uh, <laughs> Benjamin from uh, Starbucks, well done, uh, yeah. Starbucks, uh, Starbucks Accelerator. Uh, I just had a, a question on the long term. I can find it. Um, uh. So you told that the business model was not evident today. Uh, how does each of your organization make sure that you are benefiting from the long time value brought by connectivity? If you take the parallel with phone operators or hardware manufacturer in the tech industry, they are all moving to our contents. So how do you make sure of that? Thanks. Well, um, I said that the business case was, was difficult, uh, but it exists right now. So that's why we convince all our CEOs to go for a, for a connectivity deployment. I think that the uh, the 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 first uh, added value for the for the airline, uh, except for the customer satisfaction that has its own value, of course, it's uh, partnerships. Uh, you have a connectivity portal. You have all. It's evident. It's obvious what I say. But you have all your audience captive during the flight. At the time being. Uh, Internet is still a paid service for most of your customer on board. So you can focus their attention on certain websites. So you can have a commission-based partnership. And uh, the first value, you will uh, have it with your partners. Some uh, US airlines, they are more in advance compared to European airlines for connectivity. They are partnering with Amazon. Amazon is paying the Wi-Fi for the customer. Uh, so to allow the customer to just order on Amazon or benefit from uh, Amazon Prime or something. Others are partnering with Netflix, same model. Uh, so the first uh, added value is partners. So we have to hunt for the good partnerships. Uh, and then 
we are uh, digging on all the other business cases because uh, saving money, money on your maintenance, it has a value. Uh, it's um, bringing uh, a better information for your connecting passengers uh, and bringing uh, the rerouting solutions um, very quickly, uh, proactively, uh, and bringing them in the in-flight uh, coming to Charles de Gaulle and not having to queue at a desk to wait for a solution. That's a huge value for our customer and it saves us time, money, because you don't have all the frontline staff. So these technologies are really bringing value. And when you add the bricks, I think that the business case, even now, even with huge prices uh, from the satellite uh, providers, uh, it's, it is there. I'm uh, Jean-François Gaud, co-founder of uh, Satcom One, uh, a service provider uh, on the business aviation. And now I'm currently uh, chairman of uh, Airmont. I have a question for you, Anne, uh, with regards to uh, the ergonomy of payment uh, for the passengers. Uh, what do you expect as the ergonomy of payment for the passenger, credit card or other means? Well, that's a tough subject. Antoine could help me on that one. Uh, we are looking for a seamless experience in terms of payment and uh, we have many providers coming us to see us and say well, hey we have the good solution and when we dig there is no uh, perfect solution on the shelf. Uh, what we want to have uh, first connectivity allow you to have um, higher amounts for example for your duty free uh, at the time being you're kept at a certain level uh, so it, it's a, a first benefit, small one, but first benefit. What we want uh, to have um, uh, as a payment experience is that the customer can order something when you have buy on board or for duty free or anything and pay it on his personal device, either on, on the IAF or in, on its smartphone. And then it comes to the cabin crew that just have to deliver it. And just to do this, it seems to be very simple, but we are struggling for one, two years to achieve it. Because um, at the time being in a flight, the time the cabin crew spend when there is buy on board to just for such, just the payment transaction is huge. And we need the cabin crew time to be in relation with the customers and not to uh, cash the payments. So we are looking for this uh, solution there are bricks, but no one has uh, the real solution. And it will depend, once again, on your IFE provider, IFC provider. So we need um, a solution able to be agile and integrate different types of IFE and different types of IFC. I don't know if, I, if I'm clear, but if you have it, we, have, we are interested. Uh, regarding IFE, I had a question again for you, sorry. Uh, there has been a trend in some airlines to dismantle the IFE to replace just it by a Wi-Fi server, which saves uh, hundreds of kilograms of cables, which translates in uh, savings on fuel in the end. Yeah. Uh, what is uh, Air France's uh, view on that? Well, my view, and just correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, uh, first, uh, as I said, on narrow body, we are not used in Europe to have uh, sit back screen. So connectivity brings entertainment without a, any screen. On long haul, our conviction is that we won't remove the screens in the short or medium term, but we will be able to add the streaming solution on the personal device. Why? Because in some aircraft, some IFE are quite old and like technology is moving, even if your aircraft has been retrofitted very recently, in two years' time, you will, be the, you will have a new tablet that will have much more uh, definition. So uh, our conviction is that we must provide the same content, on the, uh, or almost the same, on the IFE and on the streaming solution uh, in the cabin to uh, allow the customer to choose. And that's what some airlines, for example, Delta does. 
uh, and the customers they also like to have two screens one screen for example for the movie and then as another one to see the, the aircraft route so uh, we think our goal is to have this kind of experience on our long haul uh, is there any other question in the audience Hi, Jamie Porkin from Talis. Um, we, connectivity is obviously a, a primary driver, and so is cybersecurity, because with connectivity has to come cybersecurity. But what about all the, the other digital technologies, like no, most notably big data and uh, uh, AI? How are those going to be driven into the equation, and specifically for, for the cockpit, but also for the cabin? I can certainly answer that one. Um, you, you mentioned it, uh, I think, in your in, in, in your speech, Steve. Is is really the the fourth uh, type of connectivity that is not yet developed is how we bring down all the data that are generated by by the aircraft. And today is done uh, by the engine manufacturers. Is done by the OEM uh, only at gate. And uh, so it's not real time monitoring. It's offline uh, offline data. Uh, so. We can build on that platforms, digital platforms, to really have the data analytics and to find out new services. And this is what we are currently doing in, in Thales because we have invested recently in, 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 in companies that are really specialists in, in data analytics. But I think the next step, and if we come back to the original uh, subject of the roundtable, is how we go a step further, is uh, when connectivity and when the ecosystem will be ready, and there is a question about, uh, of course, uh, certification, but to download also real-time critical data from the aircraft. And that we're not talking about dozens, we're talking about thousands of, of such parameters. Because it will allow to have this real-time monitoring of what's going on on the aircraft, about uh, either the cabin or the cockpit, all the parameters of the aircraft, or the most significant one, and to, 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 to really put that into the lake and to have all the real-time analytics to making sure that we can detect even weak signals that will really uh, threshold the fact that we need to change such a spare part, so we need to prevent such a maintenance. Uh, so we are really entering into the preventive, uh, preventive maintenance world, and it's a huge world for savings for, for airlines at the end. And I'd say I, I don't think we're very far away from that world. I mean, in terms of the capability to be able to do that, I think you know we, we've said there's whatever, uh, 5,000 planes connected, another 15,000 that need to be. But we're getting to a point now where the population is large enough, and particularly for the major airlines, um, where big data, f effectively, the, the analyst gathering the data that becomes available on board, sorting it, which is the key, right? It's, it's being able to figure out what's important in that data, what's important in that analysis, and feed that back in such a, you know, in fast enough to allow decisions to be taken as a result. We're not very far away from that world, and I think it will drive a huge amount more demand for connectivity, but more importantly, I think it'll drive a huge amount of <coughs> productivity uh, and valuable information for airlines. And I almost feel like we need to learn from the experience of rolling out connectivity and not make that same mistake in kind of the rollout of analytics. I suspect we will. Um, but sort of be ahead of the game and try and make that as common and seamless and useful now as we possibly can for, uh, for the airlines. And that's really kind of, you know, I think Talis and companies like Talis, that's really your forte. And, and certainly from my perspective, I would love um, for that to be kind of available now because it is in other industries if you look at the oil and gas industry or a number of other industries They're really using sensors and, and detectors and information in real time and and really using that information to make decisions The airline industry would benefit from that more than any other that I can think of given the amount of time that planes spend in the air um, So I really think I mean as much as as much as I want to be able to you know watch Netflix or, or you know <laughs> Uh, do my email while on board, I think that there are really, uh, really important things that we also as an industry need to make sure that we're enabling through this, uh, through this connectivity. I Can I add something? I'm sorry, but uh, um, it's very important with your question. Connectivity for an airline enables us to, uh, thanks to the connectivity portal, 
um, give chatbots. We are developing plenty of chatbots based on IA, and they would not be available on board without any connectivity. It gives us all, uh, also the opportunity to collect data, and we can imagine in the very near future that the, uh, the customer will order its meal, or whether paying or not, on the connectivity portal, and then we can collect data and know what they prefer, because it's very difficult at the time being to have the data, and know what we have to uh, put in the catering, in the choices, what they prefer, depending on the uh, personal data. And the portal will be totally, our goal is to have a portal totally personalized, uh, depending on which customer we are talking to. So AI it is at the base of all this. And just uh, as uh, I'm told to conclude, uh, I wanted just to mention that this world is really round the corner because uh, uh, two months ago there was a presentation in Paris by Rolls-Royce about their smart engine. Uh, there was a very good article in uh, Aerospatial about that. Yeah? <laughs> uh, uh, regarding so the possibilities with connectivity and artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, the engine will be able to say, oh, this part might fail in the next 20 cycles, call the uh, support system and see uh, on which of my next airport uh, there will be the possibility to get the, to get the technician and the part and remove it, change it before it fails. And it's, it's in the plan, it's where it's, they're preparing it for a for really a short time in the future. Okay, I uh, thank you for your wonderful audience, and, uh, and thank you to all my panelists.